Hi, I'm Chris Bellaton from Bethel Church in Redding, California, and this is my leader and, and pastor, Bill Johnson. Let me say hi to the team. Right. <laughs> there you go. Nice that's, to see you, my friend. That's a little awkward <laughs> opening right there, but we've been together for 41 years, and we've, um, I, I was a, a businessman in Weaverville, California. When I came to Bethel Church 21 years ago, we came, Kathy and I came to help Bill start the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. So we've been together a long time. And we have been working on this series, a five-part series about apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We're really, we're talking about the five-fold ministry. And we thought that it'd be great just to start with apostles. Bill is an apostle, and we'll talk a, a little bit about that in just a minute. But we are going to bring in a, an evangelist and a pastor and a teacher over the next few weeks. And we're going to talk about not just the theology of the fivefold ministry, but we want to talk about the relationship of fivefold ministry. And so um, I just want to just, uh, you know, just really introduce the idea, because this, this is a new concept for some people. As you were saying before we, we started, like, there are lots of people that actually don't even accept the fivefold ministry. And I think there's some people that... They may not even actually know it's in the Bible from the standpoint of theology, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. There, there are a number who don't accept the gifts of the Spirit for today, yeah. as we were saying. Like prophecy, tongues, yeah, yeah, yeah. word of knowledge, word of wisdom. They don't think that healing is still for today, etc. Yeah. But they, they, um, they also don't believe in the gifts of Christ, which is the fivefold. Yes. And then, but the strange thing is, there's many who believe in the gifts of the Spirit but don't accept. The yeah, it's kind of, and, and probably there's lots of abuses which maybe people sometimes react yeah. to abuse by developing a new theology yeah. as opposed to just dealing with the abuse itself, right? Yeah, well, it's it's thought of as a hierarchy. It's yeah. like it's like uh, to call yourself an apostle or evangelist or whatever yeah. is a self-appointed title of esteem, and it's just not. You know, Paul said the apostle is the least of all. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Ephesians chapter 4 is where we get some of our main teaching about the five, well, in fact, that's where that word fivefold comes from, because Paul actually mentions it in one passage. And it says this, Ephesians chapter 4, he gave some as apostles and prophets, some as evangelists, pastors, and teachers, mm -hmm. so that they would equip the saints to do the work of service, so that the whole body would be built up until we all attain, in fact, this is a, a really great uh, passage, and it says, we gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to equip the saints to do the work of service, to the building up the body of Christ, until, how long did he give them the fivefold, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher? Until we all attain the unity of faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature that actually belongs to Christ. In simple terms, he, we're not quite there, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> And so, you know, one of the questions people ask is like, are there apostles and prophets for today? And it's like, if you just looked at Scripture, you're like, how could you not believe that? Yeah, because, yeah. you know, the, the second point I, I, would, I would make just on that question, that we got a lot of questions like, you know, I think the apostles and prophets have passed away after the first century. And, and that, you know, some, some of the questions were like, in order to be an apostle, you have to be with Jesus. Well, that would eliminate Paul. And there were 25 named apostles, actually named apostles, in the New Testament, including one woman named Junus, there were actually no named pastors. There was one named evangelist. There was five named teachers, and there was nine named prophets in the New Testament. So think about it. we call everybody pastor, which is fine. We call people in our staff pastor, but actually in the New Testament, in the Bible, there was not a single person named pastor. I mean that they actually named as pastor, and there was only one named evangelist. So it's, it's, it's really, it feels a little odd that no one's saying like, well, there are no pastors today, there are no evangelists today, <laughs> when actually what the New Testament actually emphasized, as far as titles, if we were going to call it titles, mm -hmm. is apostles and prophets. Yeah, that's true. So, um, here's some of the questions. What is an apostle? You, you've lived your life, we don't call you Apostle Bill, we don't, we don't throw titles around. <laughs> I prefer people just call me Bill. Yes, yeah. um, it's uh, the the word means sent one. Yes, so so you know, it's it's uh, it's one sent from the Lord to establish and bring a certain kind of order in in church life. Uh, our favorite term, at least my favorite term, I think it's yours, is a culture art. So it's one yeah. who actually influences the culture of the city 
or the state nation that they are a part of. They actually are influencing the natural realm with the culture of heaven mm -hmm. as it pertains to politics, education, that whole thing. And so uh, an apostle by nature has to have a glimpse of like heavenly structure, uh, not to make it, um, you know, super yeah, spiritual, but have, have, true, a, yeah. have a, a perception of the way God structures things, whether it's for family or for church life or city, whatever. It's heavenly structure and then implementing them into how we do life. So the point would be there too that, that if you're not transforming culture, then you're not apostolic, right? Because, uh, because apostles transform a realm. And there'll, there'll be a metron, like some pastors would, some pro apostles would have a metron and would be their, just their city or there maybe be the music industry or the business industry. It, it, because they could have the gift of the oh, yeah, that's a gift, point. but not realize they have the assignment to impact culture. Yeah. So in other words, the DNA is there. They just haven't realized they have permission to actually engage that part of the world. That's that's really good. Um, embracing the fivefold ministry in the church, like how, from your perspective, like what maybe there would be questions like, does every church have the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher? On staff, uh, if they don't, like, what do you do about that? And does everybody need to have a relationship in some way with an apostle, especially right I now? Think it's, I think it's dangerous to, for example, if I were to pastor, if I were just starting in Weaverville, yeah, uh, and I had, you know, the ambition for us to have, you know, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, it's a dangerous thing for me to start looking in the congregation as to who is to who. Uh, because then you're emphasizing title and not function. Yeah. And uh, when you were uh, being raised up within mm -hmm. uh, Mountain Chapel, I let you function in the prophetic role before we ever gave you the title. Yes. So that when I finally taught on it, people could reasonably say, oh, that's what it is? Well, then that's what he is. Yeah. And uh, the function is so much more important than the title. Um, so... Um, that's that's the deal. It's it's a scary thing to feel the pressure to a point. Yes. Because then once you lay hands on people, it's hard to take them off. Paul even said that, right? Yeah. Hard to lay hands off of people. Yeah, it is. It is. And so those who are pastoring uh, uh, churches, you're not sure if you have that. The main thing is that you uh, is that you have the hunger for it. Is that you have the desire for that kind of influence in your church life influence in the city. Yeah. If you have the desire for it, the Lord will bring the right people, but let him confirm and don't be in a rush. Don't be in a rush. I'd rather see a church led by one real good pastor than a church led by five that are not so good at, in, yeah. in each of their role because they'll, they'll compete. If they're not established in maturity, they'll compete and they'll really destroy. Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot mm -hmm. of pressure and I think maybe this is why some people actually reject the fivefold ministry there's a lot of pressure to like be a fivefold church yeah and maybe you're a church of a hundred or a church of 300 and you're like okay we got to have who's our prophet we got to find a prophet who, who who has who has prophecy more than anyone else and so we end up with people who have maybe the gift of prophecy yeah. but not the office of a prophet as an example and then we put the governmental pressure yeah. of being a prophet or being an apostle and I think that that's some of why people reject it. They've seen they've seen not the false, but they've seen it. They've seen it done without wisdom. Abuse, yeah. And and then they're like, okay, well, how do we get rid of that? Oh, let, let's just take it out of the Bible, or let's let's make it for another time. Right, right. And so I I completely agree, and I think that so much dysfunction comes from what you just pointed out yeah. by by putting a governmental office on someone who either doesn't have it, yeah. or 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 they actually are immature in their in their ability to carry leadership, yep. and so that that's a that's a big question. Yeah. It's a big uh, problem, I think. Um, how do you find like you work with a lot of the fivefold? We have a lot of fivefold ministers in our in our uh, midst. Like, mm -hmm. what is your relationship with the prophets like? And I, you know, I have a I obviously worked with you forever, so and I watched you work with prophets. What what do you think should should all prophets have an apostle? Uh, what do you do if you don't? Like, is there a special, uh, is there a special relationship in the spirit with apostles and prophets? Like, just speak to that. Like, you're you're just an expert at that. Just well, just speak to any part of that that you want. Um, 
first of all, there has, you know, for it to work well, you have to have a value for what the other person brings to the table, so yeah. to speak. If I don't have a value for the prophetic, one of the first uh, things that impacted my life 45 years ago yeah. was my dad would bring in these prophets. And every one of them, you know, we hear horror stories, which, uh, which I, I know they're out there. <laughs> yeah. But my dad brought in guys and gals that were so, they loved the church so much. They loved the word so much. Yeah. They were worshipers. And so they, they could be trusted. And so I grew up with uh, cultivating an appetite for what they brought to, yes. to the game, so to speak. And so if there's not a value for the uniqueness of their gift, it's going to take away from uh, from the possibility of the relationship. Because I have to, you know, if for me to bring you into a situation, it can't be my desire for order. Yeah. It's it's not structural. It's relational. It's that I, uh, I love really yeah. who you are to me and to us, the big yeah. picture. And if I didn't love that, then I would resist bringing you in into a place of influence. Uh, it, do you think... Uh, this may be a little question because I, I actually have an answer in my mind what I think the answer is, but it may not be right. But do you think that sometimes part of the challenge is, is that you, if you if you bring in five full people, let's say you're a pastor, you're actually a five full pastor. Sometimes I think you have a hard time relating to the other gifts because they're not like you, and really that's the point, right? Yep, exactly. That is the point, and and the problem is especially for a pastor who's in charge of the church, yeah. some pastors, what they do is they'll, they'll recognize a prophet and they'll relinquish their responsibility because the prophet is here. Oh, that's really Instead good. of holding to what God has called you to do. If you're the senior leader in a given church, that other person who comes in is your guest and they're there to serve you in your yeah, role. That's really and good. that's the whole deal. Is if, I, if I go somewhere... You know, I, I, I told you before, I, I went one place, and when I got there, it was a Sunday morning, the pastor looked at me, and he said, I didn't know what you did, or I wouldn't have brought you, and I'm supposed to speak in front of the church. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of fun. Yeah, it was very encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I, I looked at him, I said, I said, not a problem. I'm here for you. Yeah. I'm actually here for you. So you tell me what you don't want me to teach on, you tell me what you don't want me to do, and I have no problem steering away from those yes. subjects and those things, because I'm actually here for you as an individual to enable you to serve these people better. That's my responsibility. And uh, and he just stared at me for like two minutes, and he, it felt like eternity. And he finally said, all right, do whatever you want. <laughs> and, and it was it was good, but the point was, mm -hmm. is I go there for, for the leader. You know, this is, a, this is a really probably a longer conversation we, we're, we're not gonna unpack today, but you've just made a really powerful point. Like if God has made you the leader of a metron, whatever that is, and right now you, you gave us an example as a local church, yep. then that that actually trumps the fact that you may be a pastor and they may be an apostle, or they may be a prophet. I'm talking about a visiting, a visiting yeah, speaker, yeah. a visiting guest, but the Lord has put you in yep. charge of that metron. Yep. Therefore, the metron leader is actually, leadership, actually trumps the office, if we can say authority, mm -hmm. because they're in your metron. They've yeah. come there to serve your your people, your your metron, whatever it is that you're doing. It's true. The, uh, the other thing I, I would bring up too is, oftentimes it can be messy and and scary to actually have relationship with people who, by God's intention, do not think through your lens, like yeah. they're an evangelist. Yeah, they're they're a, they're a, they're a prophet. They're a yeah. they're a teacher, and, and when you're a pastor. Yep. And I, to speak to that the strength <clears throat> of that diversity that inviting other office gifts in actually brings, and the beauty and the mess of it. Well, it's it's like a marriage, to be honest with yeah. you. You know, we we all. Uh, the, the word wife, help me, actually means one who is fully qualified to stand opposite her husband yeah. and to fill in whatever is missing or lacking. So it's a, it's like they are opposites and they complement. Yes. Everything in the church is very similar to that in, in, uh, in leadership. Is is if I am a pastor, if I full pastor and I bring you a prophet in, if your role intimidates me, it's going to take some time in developing a relationship where I can trust you and trust who God made me yes. to be and not become insecure, not fight for title or position. Yes. 
and it just takes time to develop a relationship where you value, you know, when you when you're dating, you know, the one who's going to be your wife, you start you start appreciating so much how unique she is, yes, and how different she is, how th she thinks so different, and it's celebrated, and that's that's what we have to have. Uh, is that diversity in the pastor or the prophet or whoever is in that in uh, in charge position? Yes, they have to actually value and celebrate the diversity that's on that team, or they will become insecure and fight for position. Yeah, I, I think insecurity destroys so many great leadership Absolutely. Uh, teams, mm -hmm. and 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 everyone has experienced insecurity. <laughs> I, I don't think there's a person alive. In fact, if you haven't experienced insecurity, you you. You probably are among a lot of small people because <laughs> you get you get big people in and you know it's just very difficult as a human to not go. I wish I could do that. <laughs> wish I could sing like that. I wish I could preach like that. You know, and that and it it that comparison thing comes up and you have to decide what you're going to do with it. Yeah, like it, it's it's human nature. It's like what do I do with it? Yeah. And and if you reduce people around you yeah. to take care of your insecurity, you actually miss the point. Of actually building a strong, strong ministry because strong ministry is built on the diversity of gifts. Yeah. Um, what do you do? Okay, let's say you're you're a leader. It might be a business leader, it might be a pastor, whatever. But you don't have. You've realized like I don't have a prophet. I don't have an apostle. Uh, and I'm I got this group of two hundred people, and we just talked about like appointing someone's a bad plan. Like mm -hmm. that isn't actually a qualified or mature. Right. So what would, what would, how would you handle that? Like, how did you handle that in Weaverville? Well, I, I did it very organically. I didn't yeah. feel any pressure to bring anybody in. Mm -hmm. But we did have people that I brought in that we developed a relationship with. There mm -hmm. was such a trust. Dick Joyce yeah, for years. Was, was such a huge friend. He would call me and just see how I was doing. A relationship built. You know, he would find out what I was learning lately. And he's the one who sent us up to Portland, to the yeah. Bible Temple up there. And uh, so he would take interest in that de that relationship developed where there was trust. In that context is where you start leaning on their gift and who they are yes. to speak in. And my dad played a certain role. Yeah, he did. Not because uh, he was my dad, but because he was my spiritual father as yeah. well. And we would bring him up as a leadership team uh, to Weaverville, and he would help us make decisions. He would help us to set direction. I would drive down to Reading every week for a while and meet with him for lunch, and I would lay out before him what we were doing, and he would give input. And uh, it's just it's smart to do it, but you've got to have trusted people. So you, you need the influence of the fivefold ministry, but it needs to it needs to not be necessarily like, it, it, at least it can't end with strategy. It, it has to have a strong relational component. Absolutely. Yeah. Relation, relational component develops trust, and trust is where it works. I, um, I was thinking about you know, we do the School of Prophets every year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the, it's one a of the, event. It, it's a great event. Yeah. And we're doing it this August, by the way. And Bethany wants to make sure I mention that we do it this August. But uh, one, the, one on. of the most asked questions, especially on the panels, I have, uh, I, my leader doesn't recognize me. I, I'm a prophet. Or my leader doesn't recognize me. I'm an apostle. And, uh, and, I, how, and, and usually it's posed like this, like, how do I get him to accept me? <laughs> Just speak to that, because we, you know, we've had how many of those people we've had here over the years. You know, it's like, yeah. I God told me to come here that I was a prophet in this church. Like, what you forgot to tell me? You know, so you just just speak to that a little bit. Like that dynamic is really alive, and it's again another reason why people reject that whole, you know, title thing. You know, God told me here I've come to be your leader. Yeah, the hierarchy thing. You know, speak speak to that a little bit. The person who thinks they're a prophet, they think they're an apostle. Like, uh, how how does how do how's that process work? The on, the personal promotion. Yeah, you you can't you you can't pursue recognition. You just can't. <laughs> it doesn't work like a career opportunity. No, but it's, you know, yeah, you don't look at the bulletin board and see what jobs are open. A prophet, I'll take that. And it just doesn't work that way. Yes, yeah. it's, it's the thing where the Lord uh, promotes. And oftentimes, I know there are some genuine prophets, genuine pastors, apostles, whatever, yeah. they're not recognized. I, I get that. And that, but that, that develops over time. But oftentimes, these are self-appointed people who had a friend who prophesied to them. Yeah. And, and you know what? 
Those kinds of positions need to be put in place through governmental prophetic words. Yes. Not just a friend who said, hey, I had a dream you were an apostle. Don't put the sign on your door <laughs> saying I'm, you know, yeah. in charge of this galaxy or something. It's just, it, 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 even if it's true, it's, it's self-promotion has to be sustained through self-promotion. Anything you get through self-promotion, you have to keep pumping that thing up. It's like a, a, yeah. a leak in a beach ball. you got to keep pumping that thing up to keep it full. Yeah. And anything that you promote yourself into is a lot of work to keep it alive. Yeah, humility is really the way forward. I was thinking about uh, David, King David. He gets anointed as king. Yeah. I, I think somewhere between 15 and 20 years before he's actually king, right? And he has a private commissioning. Yeah. And, it, you know, Jesus had favor with God and with men. And I think part of the challenge is you, you have favor with God, but maybe you don't have favor with men yet. Yep. And, and that would be like, for instance, Joseph. Joseph has a dream. He's going to be, the, you know, uh, he's going to be in leadership. He's going to be a ruler in, in the world. His brothers are going to bow down to him. The challenge is he has favor with God. But he doesn't yet have favor with man. Yeah. And so he goes out and tries to make that happen. And we all know where that went. And the, just exactly what you said, the path to promotion for him was the pit and the prison. And, you know, I know that this is a little subjective, but I think that that didn't have to be his path, but his attitude, his arrogance, Required, yeah. dictated his path. Yeah. You had Absalom who had favor with the people, yeah. but he didn't have favor with God. Yeah. And so I think that, I think it's important for people to recognize, it's like, you may have a private encounter, and God goes, you're, you're a prophet, you're a king, you're a... <clears throat> Whatever, but until until God's leadership recognizes that on you, yep. like David is anointed later on, 17 years later, he's anointed as king of Judah by the people. But 17 years earlier, the prophet anointed him in the wilderness. Yeah. But until the people actually commissioned him and said, yes, you're our leader, you're really not leading anything. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I encourage folks, listen, you feel like you're gifted, you're called to something, Go find a place to serve. And sometimes the best, best place yep. to serve is where you don't think you're gifted, which goes against all everybody's counsel. But yeah. I, I just think, you know, just get in and serve. Just just make the people around you. You know, when my, my dad was pastor here, yeah. I served him for five years before he sent us to Weaverville to pastor. But I, I had seven areas of responsibility, six were administrative. Well, that's not my gift. Yeah. But that's that's where I would serve. That's where I'd volunteer. I would serve there. I create, uh, created a business called our bookstore here. I created yep. a school. I created all this stuff, all administrative type stuff. Never felt called to do that. I didn't need to. I was called to serve my dad. That was my calling. Wow. So how it functions it really doesn't matter. You just you because you you learn who you are and you learn who you aren't. Mm -hmm. And sometimes by doing what you don't think you're gifted to do, you find that you have abilities that you didn't know you had. And it's just getting really in, getting good. in over your head where you learn to pray, yeah. and you just serve well. And that's you know all these people that aren't recognized, nobody misses a real joyful servant. Yeah, and then sometimes God just calls you to work in your weakness. I was thinking about Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. He's an expert in Judaism, exactly. and God goes, yeah, you know too much to be leading those people. <laughs> and he goes, you'll yeah. and here not only is he apostle to the Gentiles, but he's yeah. an apostle to the people that were his enemies for the early part, all of his life. Yeah. And God goes, that's who you'll be leading. And then Paul, Peter, who doesn't know much about Jews, God goes, yeah, you'll be leading the Jews. And I, and I think that there are times when we're like, God's like, we're like, God, I'm good at this. And God goes, that's great, we won't be using you there. <laughs> and, and I think that's all part of this, this, I think this journey of humility that actually you've been talking about the whole time, like really about humility, about servanthood. John the Baptist is a great example. Some might differ with me on my interpretation of this, but they come to John the Baptist and they say, are you the coming, the, the prophet? Yeah. And he goes, it's not me. And so they go to Jesus and they say, is he the prophet to come? Jesus says, yep, that's him. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I love that because he, he didn't necessarily know his title, but he knew his function. Yeah. He knew what he was supposed to do. I'm the voice that prepares the way. That's who I am. I'm the voice. I'm in the wilderness. I'm the voice. I prepare the way. He knew his assignment. 
He didn't really knew, know where he fit into the whole prophetic yeah. scheme, but he knew his assignment. That's it. That's it. I'd rather have somebody like a John the Baptist that knew what he was supposed to do than a guy running around with a billboard. That's and someone else is identifying him as your point. In this case, Jesus. Yeah, but yeah. Jesus is going, oh yeah, he's a prophet. Yeah. But he's like, I don't, I'm, I don't know, I'm a prophet. Or the prophet. The prophet, yeah. Looking for the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that's really good. It, it, you have any like last words, you know? Not my final words. <laughs> Do you know some I don't know. Know. <laughs> final words? Do you have any final? Is there anything in your heart you just want to say? A couple minutes of like you know this on this subject. Uh, you know, just in secret, cry out to God for for where your heart burns. Yeah, and pursue that until He redirects in public. You know, scrap the recognition, the yeah. you know, look at me kind of a deal. Just look where you can serve and make people around you. Uh, strong and healthy, and, and, and that's it. And uh, I, I would just rather see a house full of servants who Jesus later calls. Oh, see, he was the prophet, or he was. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, that's just healthy. It's healthy. I, I'm, I'm not afraid of titles. I don't use them. Yeah. I'm not afraid of titles. They, they don't scare me. It's just not a part of my thinking. I think in terms of function. Yeah. I think in terms of transformation of culture. I think in terms of uh, the apostle prophet add unique perspective to the same goal, the same yeah. ambition. Both the apostle and prophet have heavenly perception of structure and order. It doesn't make me more spiritual than the pastor or, the, the say, the evangelist. Yeah. I mean, it's just a heart for soul. He, he may more be more mature spiritually in some ways yes. than the prophet or the apostle. It's the gifting that enables us to see structure. That's really yeah. good. Yeah. Um, you like this conversation. <laughs> We're going to have a conversation next week um, with an evangelist, I think, Chris O, who's just a fiery guy. Yeah. Been with us for, I don't know, 15, 17, Whatever. 20 years. <laughs> and uh, so you're going to love that. And he's going to he's going to blow you up. And that's just one of his favorite words. He's going to blow us up. Um, and we have the School of Prophets coming up in August. I just want you to know about that. Bill will be teaching a session in there. And that's actually for prophets. And, uh, and and very prophetic people, not just the gift of prophecy. And we're going to we're gonna roll that out real soon. So you'll start looking for a link in the next week or so. Uh, we'd love to invite you there. And it'll be online and it'll also be on campus. So we'll have both of those uh, those venues. And uh, we're, we're very excited to, to uh, see the body of Christ grow, as Ephesians 4 yeah. talked about, be equipped and, and actually flow in all the gifts of the Spirit. So, God bless you, and well, Bill, thank you so much yeah, for being yeah, on. Yeah, I really glad. appreciate it, yeah. and uh, have a great, a great week.